Hello, good afternoon. I would like to welcome you to our today's lecture. My name is Anna Wienhardt. I'm the scientific director of the research station Geometry and Dynamics and one of the spokespersons of the Excellence Cluster Structures. And this lecture today is part of several events we have uh, this summer, which uh, go around the Poincaré conjecture, and they are embedded in two activities uh, nationwide in seven different uh, universities in Germany, where each university uh, organizes events around one of the Millennium Prize problems, uh, which were posed by the Clay Foundation 22 years ago all worth $1 million, and the Poincaré conjecture is, up to now, still the, the only one uh, which is solved. As part of the activities here in Heidelberg, we have uh, school workshops, which already started, so for uh, high school uh, pupils. We have today's lecture, which is more a mathematical um, lecture for a general interested audience, but mainly with a scientific background, and next week, uh, on Friday, we have a public lecture for the general public um, given by Sebastian Händel, who comes from Munich. So, I'm really happy that uh, so many of you made it here today, and so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our speaker today, Markus Banagel, who is a professor for topology here uh, at Heidelberg University. And he will give an introduction to the generalized Poincaré conjecture. Okay, Anna, thank you very much. Yeah, also from me, uh, welcome everybody. Um, I'm glad you could make it here. Um, so as Anna said, uh, our topic is the Poincaré conjecture. <clears throat> this, uh, the, the Millennium Prize uh, that Anna was referring to uh, is specific to dimension three, but the Poincaré conjecture, well, can be phrased in any dimension, and there are different aspects of mathematics becoming active in different dimensions, I would say. In this talk here, I will mainly focus on the high-dimensional aspects uh, of it, uh, which, uh, I mean, these aspects sparked very influential developments in high-dimensional topology and are sort of foundation, uh, make a foundation for um, the high dimensional classification theory of manifolds, uh, um, a program which is called surgery. And so the techniques that enter in the proof of the Poincare conjecture in high dimensions um, form, form a foundation in general for classifying high dimensional manifolds. Uh, so I'll focus on that mainly, although in the end, Possibly, if time remains, I can say something more about the special dimensions four and three. Okay, so let's see. What does the Poincaré conjecture uh, um, say in the first place? So the goal is to recognize a sphere, okay? And <clears throat> so you do this by making some uh, local and some global assumptions. So obviously a sphere locally looks like Rn, so you want to make that local assumption. And that leads to the notion of a manifold, right? So <clears throat> when we say uh, a space should locally be homeomorphic to Euclidean space Rn, then that leads us to the well-known notion of an n-dimensional manifold. <clears throat> so usually, I will assume manifolds here to be compact. <clears throat> so that's our local hypothesis. Now the question is what global hypothesis has to be added in order to be able to conclude that the manifold is homeomorphic, that is topologically equivalent to a sphere? Well, um, <clears throat> so of course compactness is a global assumption. But the other assumption is of a homological nature, and it has to do with whether or not you can contract loops inside of the space, as we will see. Right? So that's roughly the, the statement of the Poincaré conjecture. If you have a compact manifold, it's simply connected and has the homology of a sphere, then it should be a sphere. Right? That's the, okay. So um, let's see. Let, let me start out in low dimensions. So what are some examples of manifolds? Well, if n is zero, uh, you just have the point, 
in the connected case, and then you have finite sets of points. If n is 1, then the connected compact one-dimensional manifolds uh, are circles, and then you can take a finite disjoint union of those if you want um, <clears throat> for n equal 1. So there is not too much to be said here. It gets a little more interesting in dimension 2. So what are some two-manifolds, compact two-manifolds? Well, um, there are the orientable ones. And, for example, we have the two-sphere. Then we have the torus, right, T2. And then you can add uh, a number of holes, right? You can take a connected sum of several tori, um, and, for example, if you take a connected sum of two of them, then you get uh, a two-dimensional surface of genus 2, genus counts the number of these holes, and so on. And in general, you get a surface of some genus G, orientable. And then you have the non-orientable surfaces, so you have a real projective plane. And then you can take connected sums of those and obtain all non-orientable compact surfaces. All right, good. <clears throat> so, uh, in 1895, Poincaré wrote a very influential paper called Analysis Situs, which was one of the founding papers, I would say, of topology and specifically algebraic topology. And what he did there, among other things, is he introduced what we call homology. So this assigns to a space a sequence of abelian groups denoted hi of the space. So these are abelian groups. And you have one for each index, for each dimension, 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. <clears throat> All right. So these roughly count i-dimensional surfaces in X that do not have a boundary and are sort of closed and finite, so compact. And they, you, are, you count them modulo compact i plus one-dimensional surfaces uh, in, in the space, roughly. Okay, so let's maybe see some examples. Well, so what, what did we have here? We had a surface of, of genus G. The zero of homology uh, is always the rank, is always a free abelian group whose rank is given by the number of connected components, by the number of path components. So if it's connected, uh, then the rank is just one and you have Z. The first homology <coughs> is given by uh, a free abelian group of rank 2G, where G is the genus of the surface, and H2 is uh, again given by Z, and all others vanish. So that's what this would look like. Whereas, for instance, if you took one of these non-orientable non guys, the second homology is zero. And uh, all right, so now looking at this list, one may notice from a certain perspective the following corollary. Um, if M2 is a compact two-manifold <coughs> whose homology is isomorphic to the homology of a two-sphere, right? then M is homeomorphic to the two-sphere right? from, from this list. And of course, this uses the classification of surfaces. You have to believe in the classification of surfaces. But let's say we do that. 
then this would be a corollary. Okay? And so, therefore, <coughs> one could look at such a statement in the next higher dimension, which would be three. So, <coughs> um, there are various uh, uh, addendums to this paper analysis C2. So those were uh, Poincaré's complements. And in the second uh, complement, <coughs> Poincaré says the following. So he says, uh, if, uh, <coughs> if a compact three manifold has the homology of a three sphere, <coughs> then it is simply connected and therefore, he says, and therefore homeomorphic to a sphere, to a three sphere, to S3. Now, um, this is an interesting statement. He says, uh, well, I, I don't have time to, to work it out here. It would take me too far afield, but it's a theorem. It's true that, this, that you have this, right? So now, actually, he makes two statements, right? The first of which is wrong, the second of which is correct, but took more than a hundred years to prove, right? So, <clears throat> so it is in fact not true that um, such a manifold is simply connected. And even if it is, it is very complicated to prove. Uh, the, the word therefore is kind of funny, right? That's, that took more than a hundred years to figure out the therefore. So, um, so all right, so let's, let's investigate. Why is the first part of the statement not correct? And in fact, he realized this quickly uh, and, and then wrote about it in a later complement of this um, analysis CITUS paper. He <coughs> recognized the following example. So uh, let's see. Let, let me start. Let's say uh, G, let G be a group. then you can construct its abelianization, so you make it commutative just by dividing out by its commutator subgroup. And then you can also uh, create some language. Uh, in group theory, a group is called perfect. Perfect if this abelianization is in fact trivial. All right, so <clears throat> now let me consider the following example. Let's look at the group SO3 of special orthogonal three by three matrices. And <clears throat> there's a homomorphism from S3 to it of degree two. So topologically, SO3 is RP3, so this is the universal cover, if you're familiar with that, with that notion. Um, here you can, it's in fact a homomorphism of groups. You can imagine the three sphere as the group of unit quaternions in quaternionic space H, which you identify with R4, right, with Euclidean fourth space, uh, four space. And so inside of SO3, there is an interesting subgroup, the icosahedral group. This uh, consists of the symmetries of an icosahedron, and, um, but you just consider the orientation preserving ones. If you want the reflections also, um, then we can look at the pre-image, let's call it I prime, uh, as a subgroup of S3. 
so this group is isomorphic to an alternating group on five objects. Uh, it has, <coughs> so it has 60 elements, it's a group of order 60, and therefore this group here uh, has order one, 120. Um, let's see, so you, you could also write this group in terms of generators and relations. So what's this I prime? So that's kind of, kind of a, geometrically you figure out the symmetries and there are two generators, let me call them A and B. And the fifth power of A and the third power of B are both the square of the product of the two generators. And so that is a description, that is a presentation of, of this group I prime, sometimes called the binary icosahedral group. <clears throat> so this is the group Poincaré considered. And um, now by our construction, this I prime acts as a finite group acting freely on S3. And we can consider the orbit space, S3. Uh, modulo this group action. Let's call this sigma three. Now let's think about this space a little bit. What does it look like locally? We emphasized that locally we want this to look like Rn, but in fact, since this is a finite group acting freely on S3, um, this quotient map from S3 to the orbit space is what's called a covering map. And so locally, the quotient looks the same as the space S3. So therefore, it is also a manifold and it's clearly compact, right? So this is a three manifold, a compact three manifold, the kind of thing we are interested in at the moment. And so let's try to compute its homology. So first of all, the construction, you use a theory called covering space theory, which will tell you what the fundamental group is. So the fundamental group of a space, what is it that you do? If you have a space X, you pick a point, you fix it, you call it the base point, you consider loops at this base point, and then you consider, in fact, homotopy classes of such loops. So if you can, within X, continuously deform one loop to another, you regard them as being equal. And the group operation is just given by concatenating two paths, sort of running around the first one twice as fast, and then running, and immediately running through the second one also twice as fast, and then you have a new loop. That's the product, and it's called the fundamental group. And if, 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 if this group is the trivial group, you call the space simply connected, right? Now what is the, and this fundamental group is written as pi one of x. So what is pi one of our three manifold here? Of our sigma three. Well, uh, <coughs> covering space theory, due to its very construction, will tell us that you get exactly the group whose orbit space you took here. So it's the group I prime. Then there is a general fact in algebraic topology that the first homology of a space is just the abelianization as explained above there <coughs> of the um, fundamental group. But the fundamental group we have just observed is I prime, so we have to make this abelian. And so let's try to compute what this is. Well, if I write this and make it abelian, then I have the equations 5a equals 2a plus 2b equals 3b. And the only solution to this equation is a equals b equals 0. That's the only solution. Therefore, we have shown that this group is a perfect group. So this affinization is zero, and therefore the first homology of this is zero. 
Then there is a principle that was also observed by Poincaré, which is called Poincaré duality. And it says in this case, um, well, it could imply that the second homology of this is also zero. Right, so the homology in degree i of an n-manifold is isomorphic to the n minus i cohomology of the space. And then uh, here the dimension is 3. So n 3 minus 1 is 2. And so it will lead to the fact that this is sort of generically then true that h2 also vanishes. And, 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 and now take, taken together, this actually means that the homology of our sigma 3 is isomorphic to the homology of an actual three sphere. Yet, um, certainly, uh, sigma three is not homeomorphic to a three sphere. It's not even homotopy equivalent to it, since the fundamental group is a homotopy invariant and. Uh, the three sphere is simply connected, but this guy isn't. After all, it has a fundamental group of order 120 by our construction. So, so, uh, so they're not even, this is my symbol for homotopy equivalent. And so they're not even homotopy equivalent. Not homotopy equivalent. Let alone homeomorphic. Okay, so Poincaré realized this example. Actually, he didn't write it this way. I'm writing it like this. These descriptions came later. Poincaré actually used genus two handle bodies and threw two of those together by means of a diagram uh, called a Hagar diagram. But you know, this is this is one description of his his example. So therefore, he realized that this is not quite right. Uh, what he said earlier, and uh, there, there were, as I said, further complements, and then in his fifth complement, uh, he phrases what has hence become known as the Poincaré conjecture. So if M <coughs> is a compact three manifold, Then M is homeomorphic to this three. Note here, perhaps we should point out that in the case where the dimension is three. The assumption of simple connectivity implies automatically the homological data that we discussed, right? Because if it's simply connected, then in particular, the first homology will vanish, um, and so will the second homology by Poincaré duality, and therefore, you will then have what's called a homology field. Sphere, right? So if, this, if something like this is satisfied, if the homology is that of a sphere, we also say M is a homology sphere. And if it's homotopy equivalent to a sphere, we call it a homotopy sphere. <clears throat> now this statement is very difficult and it took more than a hundred years to prove and eventually it was proved uh, in this dimension three, by, uh, the proof was completed by Perelman, but it built very strongly on a program of Hamilton, uh, which involves the Ricci flow. So, um, but, but, but that was not obviously uh, historically what happened. Historically what happened was rather in, in, 19, in the 1960s, beginning of 1960s, 61, Snail uh, kind of shocked the mathematical world by all of a sudden showing that in high dimensions, in all dimensions five or higher, 
the statement, the Poincaré conjecture in those higher dimensions is in fact true. So that dimensions four and three became sort of isolated cases. As I said, those were then later handled with specific techniques in those dimensions. And I can maybe discuss this later. But what Smale showed, he, he proved um, <clears throat> what's called the high dimensional, high dimensional concrete uh, conjecture. So uh, that's the following statement. Uh, if Nn is a compact, smooth, simply connected N manifold, whose homology is that of an N sphere, so it's a homology N sphere, but simply connected, then N is homeomorphic to such a sphere, to, to a standard N sphere. Okay. So when I make this symbol, I mean homeomorphic. Um, you may wonder, snail assumes smooth, so why don't I get diffeomorphic, right? Why don't I get a differentiable kind of identification with the standard smooth N sphere? So I hope to explain this later. The argument, Smale's argument breaks down. Um, so the diffeomorphism would be false in general. And in fact, is connected to the existence of um, what's called exotic uh, smooth spheres. Right. So Milner discovered, for example, in dimension seven, a smooth manifold which is homeomorphic to a seven-dimensional sphere, but not diffeomorphic to it. And so the statement diffeomorphism, even assuming smoothness here, uh, is in general false. And in dimension four, the smooth Poincaré conjecture, as far as I know, is, is, is not settled. It's open, as far as I know. <clears throat> okay, so that's Smale's theory. And in the further course of the lecture, that's what I'd like to explain. So I'd like to explain more about um, yeah, and of course, I forgot to say, uh, so high dimensional, so by which I mean n greater than equal 5. So dimensions 4 and 3 are special, but in all dimensions greater or equal 5, we can recognize the sphere uh, from this kind of data. All right. So uh, in the piecewise linear category, this is also true. It was um, at about the same time proven by Stallings. Uh, at least for dimension seven or higher, five and six was open, but then quickly settled by Zeeman, actually, so that in all these dimensions in PL it's also known. And later Newman established that kind of engulfing methods that Stallings had used in the PL context, also in a purely topological context, and thereby proved the high dimensional Procure conjecture also topologically. But I wish to uh, uh, now uh, discuss Smale's theory. <clears throat> well, maybe first, even, let's discuss the following thing. Let's pose the following question. I, I first, let, let me discuss a much easier um, issue, uh, which is the following. If, um, so we, what we say is, if M is simply connected and it's a homology sphere, well, we, we claim homeomorphism, which is an extremely strong statement. A much weaker statement would be to simply say M is homotopy equivalent to this thing. Right, so 
This is, of course, a necessary condition to what we prove, but it's not perhaps a priori entirely trivial, because the homotopy groups of spheres are, in fact, very complicated. So M has to have the same homotopy groups of a sphere, uh, yet we only have this kind of homology sphere information together with simple connectivity. So it's perhaps maybe not entirely clear that even that statement is, uh, is true. But let me point out that, that this is, this, so that's the question, right? Why, why is that even true before we even start to discuss homeomorphism? And so an, an explanation is the following. Mm. If you have a homology sphere, so first of all, you can always create a map from M to an A sphere. Because M is a manifold, you select a small ball and you collapse the entire outside of the ball. Then what remains is, a, so then you get a map, you map everything outside the ball. So you map this to M, moving with M minus a small ball. Um, but this is topologically the same thing as the N modulo its boundary, which is an N minus 1 sphere, and this is just the same as an SN. So you always can make a map to a sphere. That's not a problem. <clears throat> and then let's call the map F. So you make such a map, let's call it F. Uh, so you want to see uh, that it becomes a homotopy equivalent. So the homological data will tell you that the homology of this map actually vanishes. This you get from the homological data. And then the simple connectivity is used in applying another theorem from algebraic topology called the Revich theorem. And this uses simply connected to say that the homotopy groups, pi star, of, of this map vanish. And once you have that, there's, you use a theorem called Whitehead theorem to know that F is a homotopy equivalence, and then you're finished. So I'm just pointing out that there exist some standard tools in algebraic topology uh, that, that we certainly guarantee that such an M is a homotopy sphere. So that is not the hard part, right? The hard, so the hard part, so so the hard part is therefore. Once you know that the manifold is homotopy equivalent to SN, it's a homotopy sphere, to then show that it's actually homeomorphic to SN. Right? That is the hard part that we have to understand. So suppose we knew the following. Suppose we knew the following statement. Let Wn plus 1 in greater than equal 5 
be a compact, smooth, and plus one dimensional, simply connected manifold. with boundary being the disjoint union of two manifolds, n-dimensional manifolds, closed manifolds, let's say M0 and M1, and then you have an illusion, so here's the picture, so here is M0, M1, and then we have an N plus 1 manifold compact whose boundary consists of these two manifolds. Such a thing is called a cobordism. Um, so suppose we have a cobordism between two manifolds, and it satisfies these assumptions, and moreover, uh, the inclusion of say uh, M0 and W is a homotopy equivalence. Then there exists a diffeomorphism from W to a cylinder on this A. So M0 cross so then you just take M0 and you make a cylinder on it and W, you want to recognize a cylinder in that fashion from this kind of homotopy data. So by this symbol I now mean in fact diffeomorphism. So suppose we knew this statement, then I claim the rest of the Poincaré projection is easy. But you can easily deduce it from this fact. This is, in fact, Smale's theory. Right? It's called the H. Cobordism theorem. It's a very famous theorem and extremely useful, as I said in the beginning, uh, in high dimensional topology. The H. Cobordism theorem. H because this inclusion is a homotopy equivalence. So suppose we knew this. Then my claim is that the rest, then the Poincaré conjecture falls easy, easily. Then the Poincaré conjecture is easy because what you can do is just the following thing. Now suppose in order to prove the generalized Poincaré projection by dimensions that we have our sigma A. Of sigma n. <clears throat> I could just, so here's, here's the sigma n. What I do is I just pick two points, pick two different points inside of the sphere. It's a manifold, so the neighborhood looks like a, like a disk. There's a small neighborhood that looks like a disk. So let's take such disks, uh, one here and one down here. And let's remove them. So this is maybe, maybe I imagine this to be the north pole and this is the south pole. And I call this disk dn plus and this one dn minus. And so you select them and then remove them. So, uh, so now what remains is a compact manifold on the boundary you now have spheres, because the boundary of a disk is a sphere, dimension n minus 1, so you have a southern sphere and a northern sphere. And the thing in the middle that remains, that I initially don't know anything about, I'll just call W. And this is now my W. Um, so now let's see whether I can apply the theorem here. Well, uh, we know that sigma n is simply connected, And so therefore, we can conclude that W is simply connected as well, because it has been obtained just by removing two points, and since the dimension is high, this doesn't change the fundamental group. 
So it's still simply connected, and uh, the homological data imply that the homology of W when uh, plus n minus one minus say uh, will vanish, and therefore this W is an H cohortism in this sense. And then the H cohortism theory implies that W must be a cylinder. It's in fact diffeomorphic to an n minus one sphere across an interval. So now I, I threw initially these balls away, but now I threw them back in, right? Now let's remember that we had these two disks, we just threw them back in. So what I what I obtain is W union of uh, this one, this disk, dn minus, dn plus. That's now homeomorphic. <coughs> to, well, the W is a cylinder now, so it's a dn union is n minus 1 across an interval, union d plus, but if you take an actual cylinder on the sphere and glue in two disks, the result is an n-sphere, right? So this is just an sn, whereas this is the thing that we started with. So the contrary conjecture is proven. Right? We have a homeomorphism from our sigma to a standard n sphere. Now let me point out, and here is, however, a point. Uh, so where so the cylinder is recognized diffeomorphically, but the sphere only up to homeomorphism. Why is that? Actually, what you do is so you get a diffeomorphism, and you can say more. It's, it's the identity um, on M0 identified with M0 cross 0 of the cylinder. So, but, the, but the map at 1 you cannot control. That's any diffeomorphism, right? That's some diffeomorphism about which you know essentially nothing. So, so, so on one end, you can actually uh, do with the identity, and so the thing will be smooth. Up here, to extend to, extend to a homeomorphism, doing in the other disk, you have to do something technically, which is sometimes called the Alexander trick. You extend radially the homeomorphism on the boundary sphere onto a homeomorphism between the disks. But since you do this radial extension, that's of course in general not smooth. So you lose the smoothness at exactly this point. So at the very last step, at one at this point, it fails smoothly. Only at this point. And so and in fact you can get these exotic spheres by selecting uh, sort of funny diffeomorphisms on, on boundary spheres and then doing two disks together. It's in fact how you can make exotic spheres. All right. So, um, so what I've explained then is that that we are reduced to proving the H cohortism theorem, right? If we want to understand the Poincaré equation. So, um, I, I, I was more to because I don't. My mind is only work that can break into six because of what is. Yes, yes, you are right. You are quite right. So uh, <laughs> this argument first establishes only six, but then uh, Kerber and Milner quickly extended it to five. But you're right. Technically, five would not be covered by what I said, and then Kerber and Milner made a little step to fix this. Yes. So let me say a few words then uh, about the H cohortism theory.
As I said, this is actually the core of the argument. It's not a very simple theory. Um, but I'll try to explain the main points here in the remaining time. So, sketch of the proof of the H coordinate theory. Well, uh, first of all, you need a strong vehicle to establish homeomorphism, right, or diffeomorphism. This is an extremely strong statement, so first one has to think about where this is supposed to come from, right, this bijection. This, right? So the idea is to use more theory. So the idea is to use a theory called more theory. And uh, so, in particular, you select on such a W, on an H coordinate, a Morse function F. That's a function, that's a real value, smooth function on W. And uh, Morse means that there are only, well, since W is compact, there are only finitely many critical points. And near each critical point, near each critical point locally, the function is then given by a normal form, so you can choose in suitable local coordinates uh, a representation of f near a critical point as minus x1 squared minus and so on up to minus xj squared plus xj plus 1 squared plus and so on up to xn plus 1 squared. This j that appears here is called the index of, the, uh, of f at, the, at this critical point. Right? So there's this notion of index that a Morse function has at a critical point. Now there are no obstructions to finding Morse functions. There always is a Morse function. In fact, there are many. You just pick one at random, so to speak, and you, you fix it. Now, if you are extremely lucky, then f might not have any critical points. Now in that case, if f has no critical points, then you can look at the gradient flow of f. And this will give the desired different morphism to the cylinder. And you're done. So then we're done. So uh, the problem, therefore, is of course connected to the critical points, right? In general, you select your Morse function, it will of course have critical points, and this will not work. But it suggests that perhaps um, the homotopy theoretic data that we've given ourselves here can be used to eliminate the critical points. Maybe we can modify successively and inductively the function f so as to remove all critical points and then in the end when there are no critical points anymore we can just say this and we're finished. Right? So let's see. <clears throat> so the idea then is to cancel uh, uh, critical points somehow by modifying the function until you reach this stage. So I would say the key lemma to do this is a, is a cancellation lemma which is actually due to Morse. It's not due to May. This was already observed by Morse. So Morse observed the following cancellation lemma. Let's say xj is a critical point of index j and xj plus 1 a critical point of neighboring index j plus 1. And I'd like to cancel those against each other somehow. Under what condition might this be possible? 
Morse says, here is a condition. If there is only one flow line connecting uh, xj to xj plus 1, then there exists a Morse function, let's say f prime, such that the critical points of f prime are the critical points of f minus these two points. And so they have been cancelled and have been removed. So the picture is like this. So the picture should, you should have in mind perhaps might be something like this. That's W. And so there might be two critical points of adjacent index, xj, xj plus 1. There is our function f increasing in this direction, say, that's our Morse function. And, um, okay, so there are flow lines. And so if, if there is exactly one flow line from xj to xj plus 1, Morse says, then you can modify this f up to get an f prime so that things will disappear. And here is what he's doing. How does Morse know this? He says, you, you do the following thing. If there is just one flow line, then you can select, a, you can take a small neighborhood of it, and in that neighborhood, you modify the function as follows. You modify it like this. Of course, you have to say analytically how to do it. I mean, it's a, you have to really do some analysis here. But then, uh, but it can be resolved. And then, uh, you just have this one line. You can modify it like this. You remove these two critical points. And outside, the function is not changed. So all the rest will remain the same. And, and so then we can do the, the round this program, this idea. <clears throat> so the remaining question then is, how can we guarantee that there is only one flow line? Right? This you have to somehow arrange from, this, from, from the data that, that's given to you here, from this homological data. You have to somehow guarantee this. So, <clears throat> there is a disk here called, usually uh, in this business, the left-hand disk associated to the critical point xj, I'll call it left-hand disk of j. And then there's a right-hand disk, which you see here complementary dimension. So this is a disk dj, and this is a disk, it's called the right-hand disk, and it's a disk of the complementary dimension in wn plus 1, so that's n plus 1 minus j. And a similar data you have close to xj plus 1, and here in the picture, that's sort of that is uh, the left-hand disk of this critical point, and it's a disk of dimension j plus 1. And these disks have boundaries, they have those are spheres. So uh, the, the boundary of the right-hand disk here, associated to the point j, is the right-hand sphere associated to j. That is a sphere of dimension n minus j, right? And the boundary of the left-hand disk of this point is a sphere called the left-hand sphere associated to j plus 1. That is the boundary of a j plus 1 dimensional disk and therefore is a j-dimensional sphere. 
And if we select a level here, say Y, and cut between these points, that is to say, we look at F inverse Y, then this will be a manifold. Since the point has co-dimension one in R, this is an n-dimensional manifold. And you can intersect these spheres of complementary dimension in this n-manifold. You can intersect these and look at the intersection numbers. There's an intersection matrix that you get. And now you organize this as follows. Let's say C plus one, uh, Cj plus one of W rel m zero. Let this be uh, the free Abelian group uh, generated by the um, the critical points of f of index j plus one. Okay, so you let the critical points of a given index generate uh, a free Abelian group. And uh, you can do this in any dimension. And uh, uh, these intersections give you a matrix here, which I'll call the honoring operator. So this is exactly the, the intersection matrix here. Given by intersecting these left hand spheres with right hand spheres in this manner. And then there would be a Cj minus 1 like this as well. But remember that we work inductively. So we can by induction already assume that this has been cancelled and there are no such critical points anymore. Now comes in the homological assumption that the homology of W rel m0 vanishes, which is what we assumed for the h kubodism theory. But if the homology in this degree of this chain complex should be zero, and this group is zero, it must mean that this is onto. Right? So this is onto. This um, uh, matrix has full rank. And, um, then, by elementary row operations, by a basis change here, you can therefore assume that the matrix has a row which looks like this, the first entry one. And then this one is an algebraic intersection number. So now we are almost finished. Well, there's one trick that I still have to tell you, and then we are finished. I haven't really used the dimension hypothesis, have I? I said n greater or equal to 5, but it, didn't, it seems to me this didn't really appear yet. So it seems to me I have to still say something to make this into a full proof. So you see the idea is this. This is an algebraic intersection number where things are counted algebraically, meaning you use orientations, things might cancel. They may not actually intersect geometrically in one point because there may be cancellation. If they were, if they actually intersected on this level, in exactly one point, then I would just have one flow line and I would be finished. So we somehow have to still say that if I have algebraic intersection number one, I can somehow, by further modification, achieve geometric intersection number one. Because then I would be finished according to Morse. So now, how do I achieve? Uh, 
um, that the geometric intersection of <coughs> these spheres Sj and Sn minus J is exactly one point. So let's see. So uh, here is this n manifold, the pre-image of this value of this intermediate value y. And so we have our two spheres of complementary dimension, which we intersect. And the algebraic intersection number is one. But we would like them to intersect geometrically in just one point. So what do we do? This is a method used by Whitney, and it's often called the Whitney trick. Whitney says the following. Um, if you have two intersection points of opposite sign so that they will cancel algebraically, then cancel them geometrically by doing the following. Select a path in one sphere and another path in the other sphere connecting these points. Now, since the fundamental proof is trivial, and this is where we use this, I can find homotopy theoretically a disk, a two-disk, that fills in the loop which you get by going here and then back on the other sphere. So you can find homotopy theoretically such a two-disc because of this condition. But the problem is that you can't usually disentangle in general from these spheres or remove double points. You want an actually nicely embedded two-disc whose interior is disjoint from the spheres and so on. And this you can only do um, if the dimension is high. So now the, the dimension hypothesis enters. If n is greater or equal to 5, then uh, you get an embedded D2. Uh, and then you can make it sort of disjoint from the spheres. If you were in a 4-manifold, if you have two, two spheres uh, in the four manifold, this doesn't work anymore. And then you have to do complicated things involving castle handles and infinite towers of handles and whatnot. And this is, in fact, what Friedman did. It becomes extremely complicated, topologically. Um, but if there's enough room, dimension-wise, then you can get a nice disk, and once you have it, you can sort of push an only suitable vector field on this sphere to push one sphere off the other one along this disk, um, and then you're done. You've removed these two intersection points, and then you do this for all of them until there's only one single point left. Then you can apply the worst and cancel the critical points, and then. So that finishes the proof of the H coordinates theory, and I hope I've sketched sort of the main points that you that lead to a proof in high dimensions. Okay, thanks very much. Well, thank you very much for this very nice uh, talk and um, tour through the. I mentioned Pompeii conjecture. So we have time for some questions, if there are any. Anyone? Yeah. Is the topological uh, proof of uh, in high dimension uh, following the same sort of argument that replacing most? Theory by something else, or is it completely different? It's completely different, actually. Um, <clears throat> well, maybe you can make it. I mean, historically, um, I briefly mentioned Newman, 
and Stallings and Zeman. So Stallings' idea was somewhat different. He used a technique which is called engulfing, where uh, you kind of make, you have an open set intersecting some polyhedron, and then you try to make the set bigger until it swallows the entire polyhedron. So there are techniques called engulfing in, uh, in, in topology, and, and, and Stallings used those techniques in the piecewise linear context. And then Newman saw how to extend these engulfing techniques to the topological picture. Um, and that's how it was proved in higher dimensions. And in dimension four, <coughs> the topological concurry conjecture. The topological concurry conjecture is true in all dimensions, not in all dimensions. And in dimension four, um, this was very intricate and fascinating work by Michael Friedman. And as I said, um, the, the trouble is actually with this Whitney trick construction. So, I mean, if you are actually in a four manifold, um, simply connect it so you can still homotopy theoretically find the disk. The problem is you cannot make it into an embedded disk so sort of nicely disjoint from the two spheres. So, if this is my disk, um, there, there will be double points that you have problems with. Um, but if you have two points that become double points, um, then you can connect them by a path forming a loop under this immersion and um, sort of run the same trick again giving you another disk associated to that arc. But then those disks might have the same problem again, so you make higher and higher choices of such disks, and you achieve a kind of an infinite tower called a chasm handle. And then, you, actually, this is the skeleton of a chasm handle. You have to thicken it up a little bit to get an actual chasm handle. And then that thing is a very, this is not smooth anymore. It only works topologically. Um, and then the game is to kind of shrink it again. You have to shrink it and show, and this is the main thing that Friedman did, that you can, that chasm handles are standard, in fact, actual handles. And a lot of work of geometric topology from the 1950s and 60s entered into this work of people like Bing, for instance, or Bob Edwards uh, entered there. And, uh, I think Michael Friedman used essentially um, much input also from, from Bob Edwards' work uh, to, to, to achieve this shrinking procedure. Is there any other question? So I have one actually. Many. Is there any indication that Concrete was thinking about or aware of higher dimensional version of the Concrete conjecture? Because the yeah, way he I stated mean, it is specific dimension three. That's right. Of course, he had a different model for manifolds. I mean, it was already, he talked about polyhedra, but of course, as you say, when he talked about homology and introduced homology, he was certainly thinking about higher dimensions as well. And, and in fact, if one looks at the paper carefully, if I remember correctly, it seems to me that he doesn't perhaps specifically say in all statements that he wants them to be limited to three dimensions. Yes. So I think he had high dimensions in view as well, it seems to me. So I don't think that there, I don't see any other questions. So thank you very much again. the talk by Sebastian Hensel. Thank you.